Let's open our Bibles this morning to the Old Testament book of 2 Samuel, chapter 20. 2 Samuel, chapters 20 through 22, we're talking about David's success. David has had a rocky road much of his life. He was anointed by God to become king of Israel. He had to wait, oh, close to 20 years for that to be fulfilled as he was being hunted and pursued to be killed by the first king, Saul. And uh, finally, he became king. And then his own son, Absalom, rebelled against him and tried to kill his father and instead was killed by the troops uh, and Joab, the general under King David. So David now finally has come back to Israel, to Jerusalem. He uh, had a very unfortunate affair with the woman next door, Bathsheba, had a child out of wedlock, and God took that child, and God said, because of your sin, the sword will never depart from your house. And so one by one, we saw that child die, Then we saw one of David's sons, Amnon, rape his sister, Tamar. Um, Then their brother Absalom killed Amnon. And then, of course, we mentioned the death of Absalom. And uh, it's a classic case that when you ask forgiveness, God is instant in his forgiveness. But David didn't ask forgiveness right away. In the process of uh, this illicit affair with Bathsheba. He had Bathsheba's husband killed um, to cover uh, his own sin. And um, he waited one year. And finally, God had to go after him with the prophet Nathan and indicate, your sin is known to me. Then David finally confessed it. David confessed in one of his Psalms about what it's like when you don't confess your sin, how horrible it is and the joy of knowing that once you ask forgiveness, you're you're forgiven. And so once he asked forgiveness, instantly he was forgiven. Nathan said, you are forgiven, but because of what you've done to your neighbor by killing the husband, Uriah, the sword will never depart from your house. So thank God for forgiveness of sins, but sometimes consequences are unleashed that cannot be changed. We understand that. I go out and shoot someone today and then ask forgiveness, I'm forgiven, but the state's gonna put me away. And so there are consequences to our sins and we need to ask God to help us through those difficult times. Well, he's finally back in Jerusalem. His son is dead, that's caused him great grief. David is old now, he's 68. He will die in two years and In chapter 20, we're going to see that there's another rebellion. He never had an easy life. And incidentally, his difficult life of being chased by Saul and chased by Absalom and never having an easy, peaceful time brought forth the most wonderful psalms that we have, especially the early psalms about how he called upon God and God was there for him. It was breathed out of the reality of everyday trials and tribulations. The other psalmist did a wonderful job. The professional musicians that he set up, Korah and the others, they had wonderful psalms, but they were in the cloistered confines of the temple, and their psalms were more along the lines of God is awesome, God is great, God is wonderful, and we need that as well. But David's psalms were, I was in a hard place. I almost died. My enemies came in against me, and God delivered me. So I find that when the going is getting really tough, I love the Psalms of David because they breathe reality. David will then pass the kingdom on to Solomon. Solomon's not going to have any battles. He's going to marry so many women that he has peace in all those countries. And that's what it was all about. He loved them, but it was all about politics. You, the king next door, you marry his sister, his daughter, you've got peace with that king. 700 wives, 300 concubines. Peace everywhere. But David had nothing but warfare and blood on his hands, and he loved God supremely. Solomon, with all those wives and total peace, did not have that relationship. He knew God, 
but he ended up being backslidden, worshiping the false gods of his wives, and ended up writing Ecclesiastes. He started off writing Proverbs, uh, which he got largely from his father, great wisdom about God, ended up with Ecclesiastes. Vanity, vanity, all is vanity. Nothing in life is worthwhile except your food, your work, and your beverage. That's all he could really find at the end. All those wives, all those kids, and it was just got down to his meals and his, uh, his daily job. So let's look at David's uh, handling of this rebellion. We're going to see how he deals with adversity in chapter 21 and how he praises God for the deliverance that God had given him, especially in this situation with his son Absalom trying to kill him. We find that in chapter 22. The year 972 BC, about 3,000 years ago, as always, let's ask God for help. Father, we're grateful for this chance to study your word. Help us to understand it and truly, truly be changed by it. For we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. In 2 Samuel chapter 20, we find rebellion constantly plaguing David. And there happened to be there a rebel whose name was Sheba, the son of Bichri, a Benjamite, he blew a trumpet and said, We have no share in David, nor do we have inheritance in the son of Jesse. Every man to his tents, O Israel. So every man of Israel deserted David and followed Sheba, the son of Bichri. But the men of Judah from the Jordan as far as Jerusalem remained loyal to their king. Already there was this division brewing between the ten tribes to the north, known as Israel, and the two tribes to the south, uh, known basically as Judah. Uh, Simeon would be in there also. But things are going well. He finally gets back into town, and then, whoa, this rebellion. Sheba blows the trumpet and says, let's rebel. Did you ever notice that? My advice, when you find that something goes well for you and you have a blessing and an answer to prayer, enjoy it. Really enjoy it, savor it, praise God, but don't sit back and say, my life is all set now because tomorrow more trouble happens. One of the saddest verses about Jesus is he finally gets through the 40 days of the temptation and the devil comes and tempts him one last time and um, he rebukes him and the devil departs until a more convenient time. Praise God, my problems are over until they come again. So here's another problem. What are you going to do? Sheba blows the trumpet, and the whole of those ten tribes who loved David and wanted to bring him back, now they're saying, we don't want any part of David. And so that's what life is like. I have wonderful friends, and they're supportive, and they're on my side, and I am so blessed, and I can relax. And then something happens, and next thing you know, your friends have deserted you. And that happens all too often. We love people, but our trust is in the Lord. So David, verse 3, came to his house at Jerusalem. He took the ten women, his concubines, whom he had left to keep the house. He put them in seclusion and supported them, but did not go into them. So they were shut up to the day of their death, living in widowhood. Uh, these, are widow these are concubines that he had inherited from Saul when Saul was killed. And then day, when Absalom came in, fulfilling prophecy, God had said to David, because you went into Bathsheba in secret, I'm going to send somebody who's going to go into your wives in public. And so Absalom came, and by the wise advice of his counselor, Ahithophel, went into these ten concubines, thereby saying, I have replaced my father. I am taking his, his place as king. Well, David did not want to enter these women because, again, this would be defiling it. And so he put, put them away, took care of them, but he never knew them sexually. Now, verse 4, the king said to Amasa, Amasa is his cousin. He wanted him to head the army because he always had trouble with his cousin, with his, so with his nephew, uh, Joab. This is a nephew of David, I'm sorry. Uh, Amasa is a nephew of David, and Amasa replaces another nephew, Joab, as the general. David couldn't stand Joab. Joab was rebellious. He did his own thing. He knew more than David in his own mind, so he wanted Amasa. Well, 
I think it's not a godly choice necessarily. And I think sometimes we make choices that are not godly. Uh, we make a choice that seems good. I don't like this person over here. I'm going to replace this person with another person. You put the other person in, and that doesn't work out so well. So he wanted to get rid of Joab as the general. He puts Amasa in. So he says to Amasa, verse 4, Assemble the men of Judah for me, and within three days be present here yourself. So Sheba and the ten tribes to the north are rising up against me. You've got three days. Get Judah mobilized so we can go and attack them. Time is precious. So, verse 5, Amasa went to assemble the men of Judah, but he delayed longer than the set time which David had appointed him. And David said to Abishai, that's Joab's brother, another nephew, now Sheba, the son of Bichri, will do us more harm than Absalom. Take your Lord's servants and pursue him, lest he find for himself fortified cities and escape us. So David's making a decision in the flesh. I don't like my nephew Joab. He's caused me trouble. I'm going to use my other nephew, Amasa. Amasa, get my troops together. Amasa's dragging his feet. Let's get rid of Amasa and use another nephew, Abishai, to get the troops together. Did you ever get in that kind of a posture when you're making decisions and you're frustrated and you're trying this person and you're trying that and it's not working? It's called working in the flesh. It would be so much simpler to say, God, who do you want to be the general over my troops. I'm unhappy with Joab. What do I do? Sit down and have a talk with him, rebuke him, replace him. But David's moving in the flesh. So uh, he says to Abishai, you take over. Verse 7, so Joab's men. So Abishai's in charge, but who's he in charge of? Joab's men. Abishai doesn't have any following. And so Joab's men are the ones he has to use with the Cherethites, the Pelethites, all the mighty men. They went out after him. They went out of Jerusalem to pursue Sheba, the son of Bichri. Now, when they were at the large stone, which is in Gibeon, Amasa came before them. So Joab was dressed in battle armor. On it was a belt with a sword fastened in its sheath at its hips, and he was going forward, and the sword fell out. Then Joab said to Amasa, are you in health, my brother? And Joab took Amasa by the beard with his right hand to kiss him. But Amasa did not notice the sword that was in Joab's hand. And he struck him with it in the stomach, and his entrails poured out on the ground, and he did not strike him again. Thus he died. Then Joab and Abishai, his brother, pursued Sheba, the son of Bichri. So Joab is not going down easily. His, his uncle David gets rid of him, appoints uh, his brother Abishai, and uh, Abishai looks to Joab for leadership. Joab makes sure that his cousin is put out of business. He's done this before. Joab is not going down easily, so he kills Amasa. Now there's Amasa. He runs him through, and there he is. He's wallowing in his blood by the side of the road, and he's causing attention. Verse 11, meanwhile, one of Joab's men stood near Amasa, and he said, whoever favors Joab, whoever is for David, follow Joab. See, they've, the people are following Joab because he's the natural leader. David can say, Abishai, you do it, but the people know that Joab is the leader. Amasa wallowed in his blood in the middle of the highway. When the man saw that, they uh, moved him away from the highway, put a garment over him, and then the people went on to pursue this rebel Sheba. Verse 14, and he went through all the tribes of Israel to Abel and Beth Maaka and the Berites. They gathered together and they went after this Sheba. Then they came and besieged him in Abel of Beth Maaka. They cast up a siege mound against the city. It stood by the rampart and all the people who were with Joab battered the wall to throw it down. So here is a classic case where this army of Judah under Joab is making a siege upon the city because Sheba has run into it to hide. So now they're going to use plain old military force, banging on the doors, banging on the walls, building a siege mound to get high enough to go into the walls. And don't you know, sometimes in the most difficult circumstances, God can use the most unsuspecting person to get a result. And here is a woman, 
Verse 16, a wise woman. She cries out from the city, Here, here, please say to Joab, come nearby that I may speak with you. So she's got a nerve and she wants to talk to the commander of the opposing army. When he had come near to her, she said, Are you Joab? He said, I am. Then she said to him, Hear the words of your maidservant. He said, I'm listening. So she spoke, saying, They used to talk in former times, saying, They surely shall seek guidance at Abel, and so they would end disputes. I am among the peaceable and faithful in Israel. You seek to destroy a city and a mother in Israel. Why would you swallow up the inheritance of the Lord? So why are you trying to destroy this city? Now there are a lot of men in that city behind the wall. None of them came forward, and here is a wise woman. And she's saying, what are you trying to do? So Joab answered and said, far be it from me to swallow up or destroy but this is not so. A man from the mountains of Ephraim, Sheba, has raised his hand against the king. Deliver him only, and I'll depart from the city. So the woman said to Joab, watch, his head will be thrown to you over the wall. Then the woman, in her wisdom, went to all the people. They cut off the head of Sheba, the son of Bichri, threw it out to Joab. He blew a trumpet. They withdrew from the city, every man to his tent. And Joab returned to the king at Jerusalem. So a real disaster was averted. Hundreds, perhaps thousands could have been killed. This woman has the wisdom and the courage to say, what is it you're trying to accomplish? We will do that for you. And then simply they produce the head, toss it over the wall, and the battle is ended. Meanwhile, David had sent Amasa to do the job. Then he sent Abishai to do the job. And who pops up again but his dreaded nephew, Joab. Joab's the one that comes back and gets the job done. By now, David ought to realize that whether it's of God or not, the only one who really has the ability to lead these troops of his is Joab. Well, verse 23, Joab was over all the army of Israel. Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, was over the Cherethites and the Pelethites. Those were the palace guard, the special crack soldiers uh, the Philistines who guarded David. Adoram was in charge of the revenue. Jehoshaphat, the son of Ahilud, was recorder. Shiva was a scribe. And then the same priests we saw, Zadok and Abiathar, were functioning. And Eri, or Ira the Jerite, was a chief minister or a chief priest unto David. So chapter 20 talks about this rebellion. And I've met a lesson here, I think, for chapter 20. David writes, he delivers me from my enemies. That's from Psalm 18. Here's another instance where the enemies are destroyed because God has put David in charge. When, David has you, when God puts you into his position, he's going to defend you. He will not let anything happen to you. If he's made a promise to you, let him fulfill it. Well, chapter 21 now is going to talk about adversity of a different type. This is an enemy not in human form, but in natural form, it's a famine. It's a serious famine, and he has to find out what is the cause of the famine and then take action. Chapter 21 of 2 Samuel, as David avenges the Gibeonites. Incidentally, when they first came into the land, their leader was Joshua. God had made a promise to Israel that I will give you this land, but you must follow two principles. You must destroy the Canaanites who live nearby because they are evil, they worship other gods, they will destroy your walk with me. But those who live far away will not be a threat to you. You don't need to kill them. So those nearby, kill them. Those far away, leave them alone. One clever group that lived nearby from Gibeah the Gibeonites, pretended to come from a very far away place. They got old clothing, they got old stale bread and wine and said, we've traveled from a long distance, we want to be your servants. And Joshua and the troops were fooled, they didn't inquire, and they spared them. And God said, you have spared those who live nearby and you should have killed them. So what they did is made a treaty with them. All right, we're not going to kill you, we've promised that but you'll be our servants. You'll carry our wood, you'll chop our wood, you'll build our fires, you'll be servants to us. So the Gibeonites said, fine, we're protected, you can't kill us, 
will be your servants. King Saul, the first king, violated that law and he killed them. He shed a lot of Gibeonite blood and God was not happy. And so God put a famine on the land. Now that's behind the scenes, but David doesn't know that yet. All he knows about is chapter 21 and verse 1. There was a famine in the days of David for three years, year after year. And David inquired of the Lord, and the Lord answered. So here is a famine that's gone on for three years. It takes David a while to really find out the cause. But he does go to the Lord. Inquire of the Lord. I think that's a very important principle. How many times have I had to use the phrase wisdom, Lord? Years ago, our sound person from the outside came to work on a complicated situation and he paused. He was coming up nowhere and he just simply said, wisdom, Lord. And that impressed me so much. And I've used that, especially in areas I know nothing about, such as with the computers and all this high-tech stuff here. Wisdom, Lord. And uh, even mechanical things, which I'm not good at. So go to the Lord and say, wisdom, Lord, or inquire what's going on. That's what David does. Now God answered him, it is because of Saul and his bloodthirsty house because he killed the Gibeonites. So... There's a word of knowledge. It's one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit in uh, 1 Corinthians 12. When God gives you a word of knowledge, you would not know otherwise. And it's very valuable. You go to God and God gives you something that you should not uh, know in the natural. And here's the answer. Uh, This is what's going on. This is the cause. It's because of Saul and the bloodthirsty house. Um, He's killed the Gibeonites. But you also need wisdom. That's the knowledge, then what do you do about it? And that's why there's the word of wisdom, and that's a very powerful gift. If you operate in the word of knowledge, pray that you also operate in the word of wisdom. Um, God had given me two wonderful women who operated in both of these gifts, and uh, it has been a mainstay for me. My mother operated in a powerful word of knowledge, uh, and uh, she would then go and pray for days and then come back with a word of wisdom. And it was the major force that propelled this ministry forward in the early days. And then after she passed, I found it around for three years. And he said, ah, this poor guy, he doesn't know one end from the other. And he gave me a beautiful wife, Kelly, who also operates in the word of knowledge and the word of wisdom. So we're back on track again. For those that don't know, just, uh, I, I guess it was October 16th. We came after a Thursday night service, went home. We were in the kitchen and she put her hand on my chest. Now she's a nurse, but she was not making a diagnosis medically, but she put her hand on my chest and she said, honey, there's something wrong with your heart. I said, I'm fine. I'm breathing well and no palpitations, what have you. Honey, there's something wrong with your heart. Please get it checked out. Well, miracle upon miracle, I called the next day and got right in to see the doctor. He said, you've got a severe, rapid, uh, uh, irregular heartbeat and and it was burning up. My heart was swelling uh, rapidly. 140 beats a minute, they rushed me into the hospital, and uh, two weeks later came out, open heart surgery, new valve, valve repair, uh, artery replaced, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Word of knowledge. She had a patient that uh, heard that story, and he said, you, she said, he said to her, you really love him. He said, if my wife had that condition, I think I wouldn't say anything. So, uh, <laughs> can you imagine if she put her hand there and she said, uh, I think I'll go watch television. (laughs) I would not be here now. So thanks, honey, for... (laughs) And uh, word of knowledge. Um, Pray for that gift or get get someone around you who has it. So uh, it's... um, It really happened again. This was two weeks ago. I'm very sorry to have to say this, but her grandmother was in the hospital and she had a word of knowledge. Grandma's going to die. Going to die this this time and immediately. And the, the, the whole staff said, she's fine. The, the head nurse said, she's fine. I went down to see her. She was fine. Ordered a turkey sandwich, was happy. I prayed for her, gave her a kiss. I thought, she's good for another year or so. Before midnight, she died. And uh, it's a uh, word of knowledge is a wonderful thing to have. You might not have that resident gift, but you can always say, Lord, give me wisdom. Tell me what's going on. And God will. In any event, um, He has to find out what to do about it. So it's because Saul, the previous king, who's now dead, 
had killed many Gibeonites, and God's not happy. So what did he do? Dialogue. Verse 2, he called the Gibeonites and spoke to them. The Gibeonites were not of the children of Israel. Uh, they were the, of the Amorites, and um, Saul had sought to kill them in his zeal for the children of Israel and Judah. He was trying to just conquer everybody. So David said to the Gibeonites, what shall I do for you? Now, he heard from God that there was a problem with the Gibeonites regarding Saul's killing them. But he goes to the people to say, what is it going to take to satisfy you? We need to have that combination in our lives where we go to God to get information about some things and then go to other people to have dialogue to satisfy them. We have to make sure we have that ability to do both. Lord, what's going on? And when he says, you've got a problem with so-and-so, then I go to so-and-so and say, what's going on and what's it going to take to satisfy our relationship. So uh, the Gibeonites said, um, we will have no silver, verse 4, or gold um, from Saul or from his house, nor shall you kill any man in Israel for us. We don't want that. So he says, whatever you want, I'll do it. And verse 5, as for the man who consumed us and plotted against us, that we should be destroyed, that's Saul, in seven, let seven men of his descendants be delivered to us, and we will hang them before the Lord in Gibeah of Saul, whom the Lord chose. And the king said, I will give them. So we don't want silver and gold. We don't want any lives of any innocent people. We want seven of the descendants of Saul hung to be satisfied. So verse 7, now he has to choose who is going to be offered for death. He made a covenant with Saul's son, Jonathan, that he would not touch anybody in Jonathan's line. And that includes Mephibosheth, the crippled uh, son of Jonathan. So verse 7, he spared Mephibosheth. And he then, verse 8, had to make a choice. So he took Armoni and Mephibosheth, that's another Mephibosheth, the two sons of Rizpah, the daughter of Aya, whom she bore to Saul. She was a concubine of Saul's. And then five sons of Michal, that's really Mirab, the daughter of Saul. And so he delivered them to the Gibeonites. They hanged them on the hill and they fell all seven together in the days of harvest, in the first days in the beginning of the barley harvest. So this satisfied the Lord and the famine ceased. But then to show you the human side of it, that while we can say that these deaths satisfied God and satisfied the famine situation, these were young men who had a mother, and now the mother has lost her boys. Verse 10, now Ritzpah, the daughter of Aya, took sackcloth and spread it for herself on the rock from the beginning of harvest until the late rains poured on them from heaven. She did not allow the birds of the air to rest on them by day nor the beasts of the field by night. And David was told what Ritzpah had done and um, she was trying to protect her boys' dead bodies from being picked by animals and birds and what have you. They were just laying there in the field. And so she did all she could to honor the dead bodies. Imagine her broken heart. These boys had done nothing wrong. They had not sinned. But they were in the line of Saul and um, they had to bear the consequences of it. Life is not always easy. Life is tough. We don't understand these things. But she did what she could for her boys even after they died. Well, that gave David the idea that she cared that much for her boys' dead bodies. He should honor Saul himself. Verse 12, David went and took the bones of Saul and the bones of Jonathan from the men of Jabesh Gilead who had rescued those bones from the Philistines and then he gave him a proper burial. Verse 14. And uh, then verse 15, we find that uh, David has no rest. He's got continual enemies. He put down Sheba in chapter 20 and now we got the Philistines offering more problems. They were at war with Israel and David and his servants, verse 15, went down and fought against the Philistines, and David grew faint. Then Ishbi Banab, who was one of the sons of the giant, the weight of whose bronze spearhead was 300 shekels, that's seven and a half pounds just for the spearhead alone. He was bearing a new sword, and he thought he could kill David. But Abishai, that's the nephew, the son of Zeruiah, came to his aid, struck the Philistine, and killed him. Then the men of David swore to him, saying, You shall go out no more with us to battle, lest you quench the lamp of Israel. 
So the year is 970. David is 70 years old. He will die in that year. He's very old, and uh, we think about the fact in the old days they, were, they lived longer. Well, way back before the flood they did. Methuselah lived, what, 970 or so years? By the time David's coming along 3,000 years ago, 70 is old. And um, he's about to die. He's going after the Philistine. He remembers when he was a kid, 14, 15, how he killed Goliath. He's not that man anymore. One of the most difficult parts of life is when you get older to realize you cannot do what you thought you could do. You can't do as much as you used to be able to do. And if you've been sick or had operations or what have you, you have to learn how to adjust and how to give God the opportunity to give you wisdom. How shall I live at this time? And some things we can't do, we have to pass on to the next generation. And so we need to learn how to grow old uh, gracefully and graciously. And so he understands he just can't do it anymore. He can't get out there and wield the sword the way he used to. Um, verse 18, after this, there was a battle with the Philistines. And uh, we see some of these giants falling. Sibachai uh, killed Saph. Um, there was a war at Gob in verse 19. And another uh, one of the Jews killed uh, uh, the uh, brother of Goliath, the Gittite, the shaft of whose spear was like a weaver's beam. Uh, just continual war. And um, chapter 22 now tells us about the praise that David has for God's deliverance. And again, you don't need to have David's name under the title for Psalm 18, which is the psalm that we see here. Look at Psalm 18 and you'll find it's, it's basically the same language. You don't need to find out who wrote these kinds of psalms because the professional songwriters did not talk about deliverance because their lives did not go the way of David's. They weren't on the lamb from Saul who was trying to kill him. He wasn't, uh, they weren't uh, being chased by their son Absalom. They didn't have warfare on every side. They were called to be musicians and there's nothing wrong with that. It's just that when you have no outward battles, you tend to think about God's goodness and graciousness and we need those psalms as well. But uh, David's psalms breathe reality, they breathe adversity, they breathe deliverance. Um, and when you're hurting, at least if you're like me, I go to his Psalms. Chapter 22, David spoke to the Lord the words of this song on the day when the Lord had delivered him from the hand of all of his enemies and from the hand of Saul. And he said, now you're going to see in this Psalm, in this song of praise, first of all, he's talking about God's protection. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, the God of my strength in whom I trust my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold and my refuge, my savior, you save me from violence. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemies. When the waves of death surrounded me, the floods of ungodliness made me afraid. The sorrows of Sheol or the grave surrounded me. The snares of death confronted me. In my distress, I called upon the Lord and cried out to my God. He heard my voice from his temple, and my cry entered his ears. This is the portion of the song about God's protection. I was overwhelmed. Have you ever had that situation where you feel like you're drowning? You feel like you're drowning because of one problem after another, situations beyond your control, and God, I need your help. Well, look at verse 2. He says he's the rock. The Lord is my rock. In the Old Testament, we have a number of references to the fact that God is rock. And Jesus reveals to us that he is that God. When he says to the church in the New Testament, says to his disciples, referring to the fact when Peter says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And he says, you've spoken the truth. And upon this rock, I will build my church. That rock is the Lord Jesus himself. He's our rock. Call upon him. You're my fortress, you're my deliverer, you're my strength, verse 3. I'm going to trust in you, not in man, not in self. I'm going to trust in you. You're my shield, you're my horn. The horn refers to the strength of the animal that strikes the other animals. 
You're my stronghold, my refuge, my savior. You save me from violence. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemies. We've looked at David's life and we say, I don't like the way he lived in some cases. I don't like the fact that he had adultery with Bathsheba, that he killed her husband. I don't like the fact that he had other things he did wrong. We can't judge him. Only God can judge him. And when God judges him for his sins, God also looks at his praise. And he sees here a man who has surrendered his life to God. And so you and I must not judge one another. We must follow David and be like him and say, Lord, you're my shield, my horn, my stronghold, my, my savior. As you begin to praise God like that, you're going to find, according to scripture, that God inhabits the praises of his people. You're going to find that as you praise God, your mind gets off your problem and it gets on to God. There's a direct relationship in your prayer between the time you spend on your problem and the time you spend on praising God. Spend much time in rehearsing your problem, explaining it to God, and going through all of the ramifications and commutations and permutations of your problem. And just say, God, you can handle it. And I guarantee you're going to walk away as miserable as you were when you started. Start off by the Lord said in the Lord's Prayer, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth. as Focus on God. Try this the next time you're in trouble. Try spending the first five minutes on praising God. Read this Psalm 118, or Psalm 18, and just praise God. You are powerful. You are omnipotent. You can do all things. You can solve these problems. Oh, and P.S., I'm about to go into bankruptcy, Lord. Watch what God will do for you when you spend more time on praise and less time on problems. P.S., he knows the problems ahead of time. He doesn't want to hear the problems. He wants to hear the praise. God inhabits the praises of his people, and praise builds our faith. It's a faith producer, a faith promoter. Uh, verse 5, the waves of death surrounded me, the floods of ungodliness made me afraid, the sorrows of the grave surrounded me, the snares of death confronted me. In my distress, I called upon the Lord. I cried out to my God. Here it is. He heard my voice from his temple, and my cry entered his ears. Faith abounds, and he had problems, and he took a pen and paper with him as he was being chased by Saul, and he wrote down these praises to keep himself together. Now, that's the first seven verses talking about God's protection. Now, he talks in verses 8 through 16 about his omnipotence, and incidentally, David didn't just praise God himself. He, he actually appointed people to praise God in the temple and to write music and to play instruments. He not only said play instruments, he invented instruments to praise God. Remember, his first ministry was as a musician to Saul, who had a demonic spirit, and David would no doubt compose his own songs, definitely play this little harp uh, that he used to amuse himself with when he was out in the field with the sheep when he was a younger lad, and he learned praise but guess what he did as far as praise? We had 20 minutes of praise this morning and it was beautiful. Think about this. How many hours a day did David have people praising the Lord? I know of no church that has this. 24 hours a day he had people praising God. You wonder why he was blessed? There's your answer. All right, now let's look at verses 8 through 16, the omnipotence, the all-powerful nature of God. Verse 8, then the earth shook and trembled. The foundations of heaven quaked and were shaken because he was angry. Talking about how great he is. Smoke went up from his nostrils and devouring fire from his mouth. Coals were kindled by it. He bowed the heavens also and came down with darkness under his feet. He rode upon a cherub. And he flew, he was seen upon the wings of the wind. He made darkness canopies around him, dark waters and thick clouds of the skies. From the brightness before him, coals of fire were kindled. Talking about God's power, God's greatness. And when you look at those verses and then put your problem next to it, the problem becomes dwarfed by it. There were days here in Albany, I can hardly remember one we used to have the sunshine. Remember the sun used to come out here in Albany? <laughs> it 
not much recently. You go out and you can find the sun and you know how big the sun is and how far it is away. You can Wikipedia that. Take your hand, as small as it is. In fact, I've got a spotlight right here on my right hand side and I can take my hand, I can block that, I cannot see that light. This little hand blocks that light. This same hand can go out on a sunshiny day and I can block the sun. And this hand is like our problem. God is like the sun, he's great and he's powerful, but all I can see is my problem and I can't see God. How do you get the sun to shine? Get the problem out of the way. How do you do that? Give it to God. I'm having trouble with this relative. I'm having trouble with this problem at work. I'm having trouble with my physical body. And your word says that you're a powerful healer and a savior, a deliverer. I am putting this on the altar. I'm leaving it with you and I'm going to praise God. That's how you do it. That's how you get rid of that. Call upon his omnipotence. Verse 14. The Lord thundered from heaven. The Most High uttered his voice. He sent out arrows and scattered them, lightning bolts, and he vanquished them. The channels of the sea were seen. The foundations of the world were uncovered at the rebuke of the Lord, at the blast of the breath of his nostrils. And so here we see God powerful in nature, powerful even in the oceans, the channels of the sea. There is apparently the true story of a sea captain from England who was laid up and sick and he was in the hospital in England and he was reading his Bible and he came across this very verse about the channels of the sea. This was in the 1800s. He'd been on the sea all of his life. He'd never heard about channels of the sea. When he got out of his sick bed, he began to do experiments and he got bottles and he began to, on his ship, began to put those bottles in the water and he began to see those bottles moving into a channel. The natural Waves moved right into this channel. He began to discover channels in the sea. Others got that news, and today there's not a cruise liner in the world that isn't going to try to find those channels in the sea when they go from one place to another, because guess what? They save a ton on fuel and energy by getting into the naturally created draft-producing channels of the sea. So even small things like that, somebody's going to get something good out of it. But... Um, how about, for me, channels of the sea? God, what is the way you want me to go in? And if you find godly people in your church, in your family, why don't you find out what kind of channels they're in and follow and draft them? You know about bike riding, how you draft behind the guy in front of you, or if you're a track star, you get behind him for a while and you let him break the wind and then suddenly at the end you spurt around and win. Well, there's some godly people that I know and I respect what is the channel that they're in? I want to be in that channel as well. I want to be able to live the kind of lives they do. What does this family do in the morning? How do they pray? How do they approach life? How do they handle problems? So channels of the sea, Lord, help me to be in the right channel with you. Well, verse 17 to 28, God's righteous. He sent from above. He took me. He drew me out of many waters. Don't you love that? Oh, you were drowning and he just took you right out of those waters. He delivered me from my strong enemy, from those who hated me, for they were too strong for me. They confronted me in the day of my calamity, but the Lord was my support. He also brought me out into a broad place. I love that. Oh, you ever been in a tight place? When you have fear, you're in a tight place. When you're in a difficulty, you call it being between a rock and a hard place. It's small, it's tight. God brings us into a broad place with plenty of room. He delivered me because he delighted in me. Next time you think God doesn't care about you, he delivered you because he delighted in you. The Lord rewarded me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands, he has recompensed me. And as you and I do good, we are going to be rewarded. I have kept the ways of the Lord. I have not wickedly departed from my God. For all his judgments were before me, and as for his statutes, I did not depart from them. I was also blameless before him. I kept myself from my iniquity. Therefore the Lord has recompensed me according to my righteousness, according to my cleanness in his eyes. Did he forget about Bathsheba? Did he forget about Uriah? Did he forget about the things he had done wrong? When he said he was blameless? No, no. He took those to God, he asked for God's forgiveness, he was cleansed, 
and it was done. You don't bring it up again. I thank God, if you've got a problem, you've done something wrong, you confess it, and then you don't keep bringing it up because God forgets it, he doesn't hold it to the account any longer, and there's no reason for us to do it. Once somebody said it's kind of like taking all of your sins and God throws them into this lake, and he puts up a sign saying, no fishing. We don't bring them up again, and you don't bring up somebody else's sin. You point out a sin to somebody, that person asks forgiveness of God and asks forgiveness of you, that's done. It no longer exists. You don't keep bringing it up. And so we walk in the righteousness of God, and if we sin, it's confessed, and we're forgiven. With the merciful, you'll show yourself merciful. With a blameless man, you'll show yourself blameless. With the pure, you will show yourself pure. With the devious, you'll show yourself shrewd. You will save the humble people, but your eyes are on the haughty, that you may bring them down. So God will play the game the way you want to. You want to be humble, you'll be blessed. You want to be shrewd and rebellious, he'll bring you down. Verse 29 and through 51 is about his strength for battle. You are a lamp, O Lord. The Lord shall enlighten my darkness, for by you I can run against a troop. By my God I can leap over a wall. As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is proven. He's a shield to all who trust in him. David knew all about battles. I can go against a whole army if God's on my side. Verse 32, for who is God except the Lord? And who is a rock except our God? God is my strength and power. He makes my way perfect. He makes my feet like the feet of deer and sets me on my high places. He teaches my hands to make war so that my arms can bend a bow of bronze. So God will give you the strength for the battle. And I love this expression about he makes my feet like the feet of deer. The King James Version talks about a deer is the word hind, H-I-N-D. My mother, when she first got started, gave me a little book that meant so much to her called Hind's Feet on High Places by the very gifted Hannah Hunard. And that was the story about these deer, not the kind of deer that you see in the backwoods here, but the sheep, the doll sheep who are in the high places of Alaska and other places in Europe. And um, they are just so able to get high. And when difficulties arise, let God give you hind's feet or deer's feet to get high up. When I was in Alaska for my first assignment with the military, uh, I had a colonel who was quite athletic. And I saw him one day on a, a day, hot day. He was, uh, had his knapsack on, he filled it with rocks. And he was running the track. And I said, Colonel, what are you doing? He said, I'm getting ready to go hunting. I said, hunting for what? He said, for doll sheep. And so he was getting ready to go down to fight those famous doll sheep in Alaska. They get so high up on the mountains, you have to have incredible endurance to even be able to get up there to see them. And so he got himself ready and off he went on his trip. I saw him when he came back and he was rather downcast. He had not even gotten close enough to get a picture of them or to even get a telescope on them. Those, those sheep those are so high up there. That's the kind of sheep we're talking about, the deer here. Uh, so high up that no one can touch them. And he couldn't get anywhere near to get a rifle on them. And so when times are tough, God will give you a hind's feet or a deer's feet. You get so high that uh, nothing can touch you. The devil can't touch you. You're in his hands. Get that little book and read it called Hind's Feet on High Places by Hannah Hunard. It's a marvelous, marvelous little book. In any event... Um, he says here, verse 36, you've given me the shield of salvation. Your gentleness has made me great. Isn't that marvelous? God's gentleness. You enlarged my path under me so that my feet do not slip. Again, this is Psalm 18 as well as this passage here. I recommend re you read that every day. You'll be like Superman. Nothing's going to be able to stand in your way. I have pursued my enemies and destroyed them. Neither did I turn back again till they were destroyed. I've destroyed them and wounded them so they could not rise. They have fallen under my feet, for you have armed me with the strength for battle. You've subdued under me those who rose against me. You also have given me the necks of my enemies so that I destroyed those who hated me. They looked, but there was none to save, even to the Lord, but he did not answer them. Then I beat them as fine as the dust of the earth. I trod them like dirt in the streets, 
and I spread them out. So we don't go after enemies to try to kill them, but there's enemies of disease, enemies of addiction, enemies of fear and problems, and God will give us that strength to see them destroyed before our very eyes. You have delivered me from the strivings of my people. Verse 44, the contentions. You've kept me as the head of the nations. A people I have not known shall serve me. The foreigners submit to me. As soon as they hear, they obey. The foreigners fade away and come frightened from their hideouts. And we need to trust God to keep us from the strivings. My wife was telling me yesterday how she was praying and God was giving her the ability to stay out of some strife uh, with people that she knows, not getting in and slinging mud and being a part of it, but just being above it and praying for them. God, give us the strength to do that. Verse 47, the Lord lives. Blessed be my rock. Let God be exalted, the rock of my salvation. It is God who avenges me and subdues the peoples under me. He delivers me from my enemies. You also lift me up because of those who rise against me. You've delivered me from the violent men. Therefore, I will give thanks to you, O Lord, among the Gentiles and sing praises to your name. He is the tower of salvation to his king and shows mercy to his anointed, to David and his descendants forever. What a marvelous song. It's, you know, I appreciate our worship choruses today, but they're rather repetitious and rather shallow. That's a song. And that was set to music as well. What a magnificent one. You read Psalm 18 or this portion here every day, and you're going to find yourself well fitted for the battle. And um, if you're going through a hard time, let it be an opportunity now to improve you and make you better. Adversity either makes us better or it makes us bitter. And so he had adversity, unlike the professional songwriters. They had their issues, I'm sure, in their lives, Korah and the others, but they basically sat with their robes in the, with their instruments in the temple all day and they composed music. This man was out there running for his life. And so if you're going through adversity, let this be a chance for you to develop your praise life, develop your walk with God, and then be able to share your faith with others. Because when somebody else is hurting, that person's going to sense within you the sense that you've been there and you've done that. My mother had gone through some serious adversity in her life. My wife Kelly has as well. And people are gravitating toward the people like that. And I'm tr sure towards you as well. They sense that you know what they're talking about, that you've been hurt, that you've been down, but that you have an answer, but that you've got a solution. And so you're never going to know the power of God and the deliverance of God unless you've suffered and had the occasion to call upon God. And that's why Paul writes in the book of 2 Corinthians about the God of all comfort, who comforts us with the same comfort whereby we comfort others. And so it's kind of like the measles. You can't give them unless you got them, right? And same with comfort. You're not going to be able to share it unless you've received it. So David is now about to die. He's had a long and difficult and challenging life made some serious mistakes. But he went to God, he got forgiven, and he was able to say, I stand sinless before you. And we can say the same thing as well. We are sinless when we're in Christ. If you know Jesus, he will cleanse you of your sins. If you've never called upon him, do so. And for those watching by television, YouTube, whatever, if you don't know Christ, give your heart to him. He loves you. He delights in you. He wants to bring you into his sinless perfection. He'll take your sins, he'll remove them as far as the east is from the west. He'll give you his righteousness. All you need to do is call upon him. We're going to do that right now. Let's bow our hearts before the Lord. Heavenly Father, we're grateful for the precious word of God. Thank you, Lord, for this encouraging song at the end of our study today. You are great and you are awesome. But you also, Lord, not only are the God of all creation, but you care about us individually. You delight in each one of us to the point of knowing the number of hairs on our very heads. We ask you, Lord, to forgive us for our sins. We now surrender to you, Lord Jesus, and invite you into our hearts to become our Lord, our Savior, our Deliverer, our Rock. Deliver me from my enemies, O Lord, is the cry of our hearts. I've got sickness, or I've got poverty, or I've got this, or I've got that. But Lord, 
please give wisdom of how to handle it and what the problem is and give us deliverance. We love you, Lord Jesus. We worship you in your precious name. Amen and amen.